right. Hi, everybody. I'm Tim. Hi. I'm from Pittsburgh, and this is my first Nickel City Ruby, and I am so excited. And, and I want to tell you guys about how I found my way back to software development and the key word there being back. I started my career uh, back in the 90s when dial-up was a thing and chase marquee tags around web pages was really cool. And I was like, I want to be a consultant. And I was like, I don't even know what that is. But I'm going to go to school and I'm going to be a consultant. So I went to school and I landed a job at what I thought was my dream job, which was for Anderson Consulting back at the time. And I thought, this is it. Um, people are paying me because I've been educated and I'm going to walk in and I'm going to tell people how to do stuff, right? First day I show up for training, I'm handed a stack of books about this high, two of which are the Anderson Consulting's in-house written version of how to train yourself in C and C++. And let's just say that didn't go so well. Um, one of my defining moments at that training was looking at a page full of ampersands, which apparently meant something to somebody, but meant nothing to me. And I thought, I'm not going to be able to do this. I can't do it. I lasted that job about a year. And the sad part was about that, that it turned me off to technology altogether. I didn't have folks like yourselves as mentors. It was my first job. You were thrown to the wolves. I was spooked, and I ran away. And I spent the next probably 10 or 12 years playing in marketing technology, you know, doing some database -y marketing things. And uh, ultimately, I found my way back to the community because I knew that I wanted to get back in technology, and I still feel to this day I have my own baggage that I probably can't code, and maybe I shouldn't. Uh, ampersands still freak me out. Ask anyone that works with me. But what ended up happening was I realized that I can still add value to the software development community even if I'm not a coder. And I really had never considered that until a few years ago when I said, I'm leaving marketing, I don't like marketing, I don't like CRM, I want to deal with software development again, how do I do it? And I realized that over that time when I was away from the community, the community had grown uh, to include folks such, such as yourselves that were diverse and inclusive and mentoring and actually looked at me and said, you've walked a mile in our shoes and maybe you don't code anymore, but the fact that you're there and you get us and you help motivate us and you understand what it's like to be in our shoes, we appreciate you as a project manager, as a product manager, as somebody that helps us get our work done because you know what it's like to have done it and in most cases failed. And so what I wanna leave you with guys today is something that if you ever reach that point in your careers where you're saying, I really value myself about the number of you know, lines of code that I write. And I really am thinking like maybe there's something else out there. Remember that you can add value by helping your peers and being there for them as a project manager, as a facilitator, as a coach. You don't have to write code to be able to sit with your peers and let them know that you support them and that you have walked a mile in their shoes. And just because maybe you've decided not to code anymore it does not mean that you can't continue in the community and continue to add value. And I want you all to remember that because that's been my experience. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Xiu Jiao. Uh, I'm a PhD student from. Oh, sorry, why this is automatically uh, playing this? Mm. I'm a PhD student from UB. Uh, my major is computer science. Uh, I got to attend this conference last, last year uh, when I had an internship at Engine Yard uh, last summer. Uh, I'm very happy uh, I'm here again this year. Uh, today, Oh, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> I need a PG ask me questions. <laughs> so uh, I want to share a tiny story about myself today. Uh, three years ago, I fly all the way from, from China to the USA to do collocation. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, I work. <laughs> uh, I worked on the problem called multicast virtual networking. Uh, network mapping. Uh, I know you may don't care what's that, but I, I proposed the MIRP. Uh, it's mixed integer linear programming, and I want to impl implement this use C++. Plex. But also, I have other uh, heuristic solutions. I prefer to uh, implement them use C++. So I, I kind of need to combine these two. I, I call it my C++ extension. 
mm, not as cool as the C extension we saw yesterday, like that magic robot, but it still works. So I, I got my simulation running, so I was so happy. So I sit down, I, I try to do something for fun. So I call, call in MATLAB to, to generate music. <laughs> oh, there we go. So uh, I always try to do multiple things at the same time to efficiently use my time. So I danced along with music. I pay attention to my simulation running. Also, uh, I watched the uh, BBT. <laughs> Oh, actually, that laugh is not supposed to come here. <laughs> so then I'm thinking, is this concurrency? Oh, wait a second. We learned yesterday uh, concurrency doesn't equal this. Actually, that MATLAB laugh is supposed to come here. <laughs> because then suddenly, I found uh, there is a, a, mis a bug in my simulation. So it has stopped running. I was so frustrated. But then I come down and sit down because I learned don't feel to failure. And so I start to debug, debug to feel fast. So finally, uh, my simulation runs successfully. I got a date uh, I can use to write papers to submit to good conferences. Um, but then there is another question. What I should do next after this codecation? Oh, I don't know this automatically play. Uh, doesn't listen to my comment. It always jump to next slides. Mm, but uh, it's good. I can take it back. Uh, so I'm thinking what I should do next. Part of me, I'm thinking, oh, after I graduate, I should go to academic area because I have been a student expert for more than 20 years. And I know how to do research. I love teaching. But also part of me, I'm thinking, maybe I should go to industry and work at a company because I had this experience working with those Wonderful people at Engineered, I enjoy it a lot. So it's like I contradict myself. Actually, there are multiple versions of me of that. I, we, I have multitudes of that. <laughs> yeah, you see that. But it's good, uh, I'm smart. I know how to deal with this. So finally, I decide, first, I will focus on my research, uh, try to make good publications during the semester. Also, uh, try to find another internship during next summer. Then after that, I believe I will become more clear about what I want to do uh, in future. Also, no matter which one I pick, I believe I, I will benefit from it because those two areas are not uh, com completely separate. Actually, they are related. Uh, also, the last thing, <laughs> I brought a resume with me. Uh, please come to see me. <laughs> you can get one. <laughs> and uh, and the, more, the more important thing is first come, first served. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi, so I'm Joe, first conference, so of course, lightning talk, obvious thing, right? <laughs> so then I thought, what can I do to make life easy for myself, and what can I do in five minutes? Processes in Ruby, perfect thing. So the thing is, we've had two great talks that I loved on service-oriented architecture and concurrency. And we know threads are hard. I've been trying threads, I've been failing at threads for a long time, and what I find I usually resort to is using processes instead. Because the whole thing that makes threads hard is you share the same memory space. But in processes, you don't. You fork the memory space. That's literally the command in Ruby. You type fork and you get a new process. And it's even better in Ruby 2.1 than it has been before, because previous to Ruby 2.1, what we had was when you typed fork, it forked the entire stack. 600 meg interpreter copied into an entire new process. Now that, that's somewhat inefficient, I must admit. But copy on write came in in 2.1, which basically means it only changes the bit it needs. So suddenly, forking your processes is blindingly fast, and you can guarantee they can't mess with each other's memory spaces, which is really awesome. And I find in a Rails world, I don't need threads. I need processes. My standard use case is something like, Hey, I've got, I'm going to wait for an API request and then kick off a background task or something off it if, if I'm writing a small service. And that's 
that can be done with the process. You have one web server process, one API requesting process, and the web server, when it gets it, sends a kill signal to the other one. Signals. We've used them in Ruby. You've probably, probably all typed kill at some point. What's not as common knowledge is that kill has two extra signals. You've got kill one, which is the standard quit, kill nine, which is the nuke it all and burn it all down to the ground, USR1 and USR2. Now I'm gonna take a brief detour here, unicorn. Unicorn is wonderful, we all love unicorn, and this is how unicorn functions. Unicorn uses signal processing to communicate between its processes. Each unicorn worker, for want of a better word, because I've forgotten the actual name, is its own process. You have a master process that spawns them off to respond to things. And um, if you send a USR2, I think, to Unicorn, it does a rolling restart, which is cool. But that's the thing. That most of the time, if you're writing services, distinct small services, you don't need to share tons of state. You don't need a huge memory usage. You just need to be able to send the occasional signal going, hey, do your thing now. It's time. Hey, I need you to do this. And if you do, and in Ruby, it's really easy to trap them. Like, you've got a, a, signal, a, a signal class with a method trap. Literally, if I want to do something when it comes in, I type signal.trap, pa pass a block, and whenever that signal arrives, the interpreter will pause, execute the block, and done. It's that simple. And it, you tie it into something like event machine, and you've got easy, easy multi-process code without any of the headaches that come with using threats. And finally, sometimes you do need to talk. Sometimes you do have two processes that actually need to share information and don't particularly want to go to the effort of putting in Redis or SQL database and putting things in, taking them out, pushing things in, taking them out, worrying about load balancing, having your database process die off, those sort of things. So what, you can use pipes. I mean, pipes are a basic form of like, system. We've used them forever. I mean, personally, PS, AUX, grep, process name. That's a pipe. You're piping one command into another. And in Ruby, all you do is you define, a, you define a pipe object before your block. So before you type the word fork, you just type, I think it's uh, io.pipe, and it returns two objects, a reader and a writer. You can do that and reverse them. Then you type fork. And because they started with the same initial shared memory space, they, can, the, they hold the ends of the pipe open, and you can communicate through the pipe. And those are basically the only two things you need to do, to do processes in Ruby. You type fork, you use trap to trap signals, and signal.kill, I think, um, to communicate between them, and you use pipes. That's it. And that's multi-process, and that's multi-thread architecture in scalable, reasonably scalable fashion, as long as you don't have to go across multiple machines. So yeah, that's me. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, this is a really quick uh, little rant, mini rant that I have. Um, get a non-job, you hippies. So I like people. As a programmer, I understand that I'm a little bit weird. Um, one of the things that uh, comes along with liking people is learning how to have conversations. And there's something called the Ford model to having conversations. And Ford stands for family, occupation, recreation, and dreams. And these are the things that you want to engage people about. Um, unfortunately, you burn through family and occupation in about 10 seconds. And um, I, I love your kids, but you know what I really want to make connections with people, we really want to talk to them about what their recreations are and what their dreams are. You want to improve. Shit, pony. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Tricks on you. You want to improve. You want to get better as a developer. You want to move from mid-developer to senior or up to lead or something like that. But it feels like this. It's a lot of disorganized pieces. And at the same time, as a larger culture uh, industry, we want more diversity. But how do we do this? How do you do this for yourself? Go get a hobby. But Carrie, there's a pony. <laughs> also, I'm really busy. I've got a day job and a family and kids and all that sort of stuff. Well, you can do this in bits and pieces and, and starts. It's really important to do, though. So go, go get a hobby. It can't be about code. It has to be something that most other coders aren't really into and involves people in your physical world. Um, and that it has something that's out. It's a third place activity. It's not in your home necessarily, and it's not at your job. But why? I'm busy. Alan Kay said, a change in perspective is worth 80 points of IQ. And as soon as you step outside of your bubble, 
all of these wonderful things happen. And primarily, the, the, one of the big benefits is you start talking to people who aren't like you, who have different, uh, different backgrounds, different ethnicities, races, jobs that they do, different income levels, and you learn how that group solves problems and how they talk to each other and what they care about. And you start to see parallels and differences. You start to see solutions you can bring into the programming world. But most of all, you know what? You end up being more interesting and you're able to make connections with people on the level of recreation and dreams because it's not you taking from them, it's you giving back to them. I'm, every, I'm Carrie Zor everywhere. This is some of the stuff I'm interested. If you wanna talk about any of these things, I will bend your ear off forever about it. Um, I'm Jacqueline, this is my second uh, Ruby, Nickel City Ruby Conference, and um, I'm a junior developer, and uh, what I wanted to find, but I couldn't find, but that's all right, I'll find it later. Um, it, was, uh, it was my very first uh, tutorial app that I, I created myself using purely JavaScript, um, but I'm, I'm learning, you know, I'm a Ruby on Rails developer, but I wanted to learn JavaScript, PHP, everything else, Mage, you know, you name it, I don't care. If it's code, I'm good. Um, how I got into this is a really weird story, but in short, I almost turned away from the opportunity to learn how to write code because I was surrounded by people who did not know anything about who developers are and what IT really is. And yet all of these people were determined to argue for my limitations and say, oh, you know, Jacqueline, would you, she'd never be able to learn that. What, we, you know, that's nuts. One person who was a member of the Ruby community in Arlington, Virginia, who's a, an anti-trafficking advocate and he's a very dear friend of mine, Ed Drain, his combat vet, he was the only one who refused to argue for my limitations and that was a transformative friendship. That got me into learning code. And what I found is all the people that were interested in arguing for my limitations, they could hide in the bushes and watch while I learned how to write code. And that's what I've been doing. <laughs> for a year and a half is learning and loving a learning occupation and how all of the things and the things and the things and the things that it's a never ending journey. It's like that story, the never ending story. That is what this is, except it's a lot more fun. <laughs> and um, uh, another another ins inspiration for me was Ben Ornstein from from Thoughtbot, and and he would he was also a very very welcoming uh, person as as well as the guys from Buffalo Ruby. You know, wonderful community. Uh, I can't speak enough as to how much I love what I'm learning and growing as a Ruby and Rails developer and PHP developer and JavaScript developer, developer developer. If it's code. I'm down, <laughs> all right? And I wanted to say to anybody else in this room who is relatively new to code, I'm new, I'm you know year and a half in as a junior dev, don't let anybody argue for your limitations and tell you what you can't do. They can go hide in the bushes and watch while you learn or you know live and learn how to write code and enjoy yourself, right? And that's all I gotta say. So um, yeah, we got a couple of blank slides here. Um, this is what happens whenever you go into a presentation and you don't know what the resolution is. But this slide actually does say you don't know shh. And the second slide actually says, um, it's talking about, I'm gonna talk about the shell. Here, who, who here likes the shell? Are, are you guys shell fans? Yeah, All right, so, um, so I'm super, I'm super huge into Z shell, Z shell, whatever you wanna call it. Um, and this shell is my rifle. So what do I do with my rifle? Um, obligatory um, keynote, superfluous stuff. Um, so what I would like you guys to do is um, sometime exec ZSH. And then I want you to try something here. And this is, and I'm gonna lightning talk so I can only do this for a couple seconds is, um, Shell has, uh, Zed Shell has um, some really crazy escape hacks. And I wanna show you these because I don't see people using these enough. Um, there's escape period, escape single quote, and escape return. And I'm gonna show you what they do here. 
So, is this one on? Yeah. All right. So, um, you're in a directory, and I'm going to put this back up to the top, and I'm going to actually type and look the other direction. So, let's say you are um, doing command. Um, one thing I do a lot is um, I like to look in directories. So, I type ls. And let's say I want to look in this colors directory. So, I'm going to do ls colors because, you know, I want to see what colors I have in this directory. Now, what if I wanted to do something else with this colors directory? Um, I could just type another command, or if I'm using super awesome Z shell, what I could do is actually just type, um, I could type rm-rf and then hit escape period. And it takes the actual arguments from the command that you ran before so you can run them again. Another cool thing you can do inside of Z shell, Z shell, is uh, I'm, in my, I'm still in my library directory on a Mac. Um, I actually want to go into, wait, what's that directory called? Application support. So I want to go into my application support directory. Sorry, I use um, colors in mine, and they're not showing up great here. But I didn't quote it. And so another thing you can do is you can do escape single quote, and it'll actually quote your, um, your command. And because I use super awesome Z shell, um, CD is for losers. I don't need that thing. You just type a directory name for me, and it comes in. And the last thing I'm going to show, I think here, because um, I only have a couple seconds, and I got 40 minutes with you guys coming up pretty soon, so I don't want to be here that long. Um, what you can do is sometimes we type long commands. And if you see them in documents, it's going to have like a slash behind it so you can continue the command. But you know what? Z shell superfluous, superfluous characters suck. So what if I wanted to actually have a long command? I can actually do this, escape, enter. It gives me a new line. And it's very clear, it's very intention revealing, and it's pretty awesome. So let's go back to my slides. Um, so this is how I feel when I, this is actually my Nick Caronto slide. Um, he likes things that move. Um, so you can get around. Um, CDs for people who don't understand, you should know about PushD and PopD, but actually inside of um, Z shell, you can actually turn on auto PushD. So whenever you go to a directory, it remembers what it is. So whenever you type PopD, it actually gets you back. Um, you can use DERS S or DERS dash V to list what your, um, your pop stack is. That does work in bash. Um, and you can have Z. Z is the coolest command ever. It remembers every single directory you've ever gone in. So I'm gonna show you this real quick. So um, I'm gonna show you super, super secret DigitalOcean stuff. Don't tell anybody. Um, so we have a project called Atlantis. I'm not going to tell you what it is because that's not important. Um, but you notice that I just typed Z A T L A and it put me in the right directory. If I wanted to go to my porn directory, there is no porn directory on my laptop, so it doesn't go there. Um, but if I want to go to my documents, it goes there again. Or it goes put me in a documentation. Z is awesome. You should use it. All the things. There is no porn in this list. Um, so that's all I wanted to show, and um, I love lightning talks, and I love sharing. Hopefully someone learned something out of this. Thank you. Hi, guys. How are you doing? All right. This is my first, second conference ever, first conference talk ever. I've been coding for about a year. I was living in Shenzhen, China, uh, working in a lot of Chinese factories, doing quality control. I wrote this little app uh, to help my company manage its data. And so you can see here we have a, a spreadsheet. We can like search for stuff, and it'll come up, and, and it'll return the stuff to us. And this table is made up of like 8 trillion different database tables, and it's a database view. And it was super slow to search over, do full text search, do filtering. It was just really slow. So I decided for my first gem ever, I was going to work on caching and cache invalidation, because what better place to start with programming? So um, yeah, let me show you some, some commits that I made on that project. Commit message number one, vim rspec is hard. Commit message number two, vim rspec is not working. Commit message number three, why am I getting segmentation fault? So, um, yeah, I wrote a materialized view in Postgres. So, so what that is, is it's like a database view, and then you save all the data into a table so that you can index it. And then you drive yourself crazy trying to update the table whenever 
any of the underlying tables changes. And it's crazy complicated. Here's some code from, uh, here's some code that helped me do that. And it looks really bad. SQL snippets. That's all I have to say. Um, there is one really cool thing about it, though. And that's the um, gold standard test. that I wrote to check if the view is up to date or not. So what this does is it looks at the unmaterialized database view. It looks at the table where I'm saving all of my data. And it compares every row and sees if there's anything different between them. So here you can see there's nothing different. The array of differences was empty. So all right, that means that uh, we're up to date. So that's good. And this is a blog post. It's from Code Climate. It's about gold master testing. And gold master testing is, instead of writing like individual RSpec examples where you, where you like enter something into the database, make sure the materialized view is correct for that, you just take your entire table, you spit it through your system, and you compare it with what that same output looked like, like a week ago, and make sure that they're exactly correct. So you're validating like tons and tons of data all at the same time. Now, later on, I learned about um, Sunspot. And it turns out that Sunspot and things like the Solar Search Engine and Elasticsearch are way, way easier than this. <laughs> I was really glad when I found out about Sunspot. The only thing is, um, I would really like to be able to run a gold standard test on my production data. So I want to make sure that my Sunspot index is fully up to date. Uh, if I'm doing a Postgres materialized view, I'm able to do that with this, uh, with this rake task. And this talk is just to ask you guys if any of you know how to run such a test with, um, if you're using Sunspot or Elasticsearch, then come get me and we can talk about it. Um, <coughs> Sunspot is cool, and I really want to test it, and I really want to do gold master testing on it, and I really don't want to do this anymore. You should check out this blog. It's called worstcats.tumblr.com. It's not mine, but uh, it's a really great blog about terrible cats. <laughs> this is my favorite one. All right, that's it. Thank you, guys. Let me be a little bit more fair about that. Uh, I think they have their uses, but I, I think there's better ways about going about testing your application. So why I don't like controller tests? So I'm Aaron McLeod. Yeah, like Fox McLeod. And I don't know if that seemed right to throw in. Um, but, <laughs> but anyway, uh, testing your business logic. So as I've been working on uh, apps over the past year, I've actually done a lot of testing. At my job, we brought in uh, more CI and things like that, so our long-live applications that we occasionally do, we started writing more test coverage for. So one of our older apps, I was writing a lot of controller tests for. And that worked out OK in certain ways. But as I started working on newer applications and that and doing more integration tests, I found that was just working a lot better for me. Because um, typically what you want to aim for is thin controllers, right? Like we've been talking about this for at least a few years now. Thin controllers, like fat models, or whatever pattern you want to use from there. Um, but really a thin controller, all it really does is you know, trigger active record, maybe render some stuff, do a little bit of extra logic here or there, uh, before filters and that. Like nothing too complicated. Like you're mostly just calling Rails methods, which are tested. Like we don't want to be testing Rails stuff, right? Like that's just not a good use of our time. So basically, here's an example of like what you might do a controller test. Now this is a little bit of a, a an unfair example, but I'm basically showing a post in the controller, and then I have a test saying it should assign the post uh, attribute. And that does give some value, I mean, because your view is obviously going to expect that. So as long as you know you're setting that, you should hopefully get something in your view. But to be honest, if you try and rename something or you know, there's other things in your view you're doing, you're not going to really find them as easy with the controller test. So 
And this even goes further with um, like a post uh, create. So this is just a pretty simple post like from you would get when you scaffold a new app. And then here's the test for it. And this is where I find it can get a little tricky when you start getting a lot larger apps is you start passing all your params through in the test case. And when it goes through, it runs the action and all your before filters and that, but it also doesn't actually render any data. It just kind of fakes it in a more or less, more or less yeah. Um, so this is where I find integration tests just work better. And sorry, too fast. Um, basically, when you're hitting an integration test, you're rendering the new view, you're pumping the data into the form, you're submitting it through, you're testing the full stack. And as you start adding new stuff to your application, you're catching more with that. So even when I started doing this more, I still found use for controller tests with testing APIs. Um, but I hit a limitation on this a bit earlier, like a few months ago, and this is where I was working on a bit of a more fancier API using like a lot of the hypermedia stuff. So we'll have like links for pagination, links for the current page, and things like that. I had no real way of testing that from a controller test, because again, we're not rendering anything out. These controller tests for APIs are really good when you're doing like a REST API. You want to make sure that records are getting saved or records are getting retrieved properly, that your API token is authenticating properly. Um, but again, like when I wanted to test out this pagination stuff, um, I had accidentally broke it. Our staging build wasn't working, and I didn't notice until we realized the issue. And so then I started, OK, I'm going to write integration tests for this API. And that made things a lot smoother as we continue to work on this service. So in closing, um, I do still think controller tests have their uses. Like if you have an older app that maybe you want to refactor, so you can't really just rely on integration tests, like you need to test the internals of a controller more, then maybe it's not a bad idea to just write some up front, and that way you can feel a bit more comfortable before you're changing one of your older applications. And uh, so that's where they can be used. But I think if you're starting on a new app, Try and use integration tests, you know, unit tests or models and all that kind of stuff. And as you're going through it, you feel there's stuff that maybe the integration tests just aren't quite uh, covering, then that's where you can kind of dive deeper and really cover things more in depth. So thanks very much. Hi, everyone. My name is Dave. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, I'm going to kind of tell a personal story. Um, about a couple of weeks ago, I started thinking about everything I was doing in life, I was trying to find the minimum of stuff. And I think as programmers, we're very good at this. We're thinking about how can you optimize things? What's the least amount of code we can write? How clever can we be to do this thing in one line instead of 10? Um, but it goes beyond that in the sense that giving presentations or doing talks or talking to people or teaching someone, what's the least amount of information you can actually give to them to get your point across. Uh, this goes back to teaching as well. What Can you ask one question as opposed to telling them how to do things or like telling them 10 things? There's, I was started reading about um, infinity at one point on some tangent. And this is like a semi-correct fact. Um, in the 1600s or so, that's probably the incorrect part, mathematicians believed that infinity kind of represented God. There was like one infinity and we can never touch it. It's this like unbelievable thing. And then another mathematician came around. I don't know his name, another bad fact. Um, he started proving that there was different types of infinity. Some went to infinity faster, some were kind of infinity, but kind of not because they like didn't really get all the way up there, but they kept increasing. And mathematicians were like, this is total crap. Like they banished him from the mathematical society and everything and he couldn't get into the club anymore. Um, so I started thinking about this too with the minimum and as children, like we're always focused on the maximum because we're exploring our boundaries and you get into coding, get into music, you get into anything, like what's the biggest dinosaur there ever was? You know, like who can play guitar the fastest? You know, that person got older and he no longer plays fast guitar so he probably sucks. Um, <laughs> you know, what's the, what's the fastest animal? And it's always talking about the maximum and the maximum and the maximum. And then as you get older, you start thinking about the minimum and the minimum. And the maximum curve is just a linear curve going to infinity. And do you ever get there? No, because it's infinity. You can never get anywhere beyond just climbing this endless hill. But if you take the inverse of that and you go one over in, 
uh, infinity, you start to get uh, an exponential curve down. And to me, that represents subtlety. So as you're traversing this path, you start getting less and less increment, increments, and you start to recognize more and more the subtleties of what you're doing and what other people are doing. And to me, one over infinity is perfection. If you can get to the point where you can recognize the subtleties in everything that you're doing and everything that everyone else is doing, then perhaps perfection is attainable, but not retainable. You have to keep retaining it every single time. And that's all. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jam. I am from Washington, DC. And I just decided to do this, or give this talk uh, less than like maybe 50 minutes ago, so please bear with me. Um, I'll try to get through these slides pretty fast so that I can demo um, our gym. So um, I am uh, gonna talk about Rails Girl Summer of Code and Team Browser Spree, which was the team that I participated in. Um, <laughs> My team member isn't here, but um, as I said, I'm Jam, and her name is Brittany. Um, and here are just some places if you want to demo um, our app, or if you um, want to find out more about our work, you can go to these links here, and I'll have them for you if you, if you want to talk about it after this talk. All right, so Rails Girls, um, actually, I've come to learn that Rails Girls uh, started from Rails Bridge, which was awesome. Um, but we started uh, back in uh, November of 2010 and basic, in, in Helsinki, Finland. Um, and it was just, uh, I guess, a, a group of people that got together and wanted to teach um, or create a comfortable environment for women to learn to code. And um, since then, we've seen um, Similar, uh, I, I hate to say chapters because it's not chapters by anything by by any stretch of the imagi imagination, but workshops um, that have um, stemmed from just that one uh, meeting back in 2010, and um, I'm actually a product of that. Um, so Rails Girl Summer of Code, um, this is the second year, uh, but basically they picked 10 teams across the uh, world to um, work on open source projects from July 1st through September 30th. And um, we're paid $1,500 monthly, and we apply, um, you pick your project team, and you uh, pick your coaches, and then you propose your projects, and then if you're selected, then you know you go on and, and work on your open source projects. And so we were selected. Um, so this is Team Browser Spree. Um, it's Brittany and I, of course, um, and then, uh, um, Patrick Peak um, of uh, Include at the time when we started um, is our coach or was our coach and also uh, Tanya um, Bodania, I think is how you say your last name. Um, they were both our coaches and um, Include actually hosted us. Um, so our goal, so we were going to build a, a um, Browser CMS and Spree um, integration module. Um, so Browser CMS is a Rails content management system. Spree is an e-commerce um, um, Rails um, system or tool, whatever. Uh, and so we uh, set forth uh, the following goals, basically, to um, build uh, our own Browser CMS uh, stores as much as possible. Um, we tried to build bookstores um, just so we can get familiar with Browser CMS. Um, and then um, we uh, updated the Browser CMS documentation. Um, we, uh, it only took us a few weeks to become familiar with Spree because Spree's documentation is so awesome and you know, it, it didn't require a lot of the configuration um, from an e-commerce standpoint that uh, was required for Browser CMS because Spree is an e-commerce tool or an e-commerce uh, application. Um, so let's see. And then we also gave lightning talks at Still City Ruby, and I'm giving lightning talk here, and we gave a lightning talk or some form of a, a talk at Ruby for Good. Okay. So this is how it works. So we had, uh, <laughs> we, Brittany and I both have full-time jobs. We actually got new full-time jobs around the time uh, when this, this whole thing started. Um, so we could only really work on it, you know, after work or during downtimes at work. Um, so we, uh, Oh man, you know, this is, I missed a slide. But anyway, so every, every time we would get started around maybe like as soon as we, let's say we started at five, five o'clock at, at five or two, you know, we'd see an error on the screen and we, you know, would have to lean on our uh, either documentation or, um, you know, Google to get through that. Um, so of course we felt like quitting immediately um, after that. Um, but we persisted and, um, ultimately got to the point where we have our own gym now. And so now we're basically the, I'll let you fill in whatever that word is, we're the ish, basically. <laughs> um, so, oh God. Anyway, so introdu introducing uh, browser CMS uh, spray. So um, 
and we actually uh, rolled this out on October 1st. Um, browser CMS um, Spree is, like I said, it's an integration module. The one thing that was difficult is when dealing with these two Rails engines, I'm gonna keep just going through that. When dealing uh, with these two Rails engines, um, we had conflicts with, uh, of course, gem, de gem dependencies, particularly uh, uh, Paperclip uh, 3.1, or 3.4.1, 3 and then um, also uh, some Rails um, dependency issues, which I can get into more later. Um, really quick if I can, and I'm sorry if I go over time. So um, this is our demo app um, that you can access here. But basically, if I were to log into uh, CMS admin and then CMS ad, admin um, and sign in, um, so this is Browser CMS, um, if I go to forward slash uh, shop, then you can see um, all of the products in our shop. And this is just C data. Um, if, let's see, I were to go back here. Uh, we mounted shop, or we included shop in the navigation, or the, yeah, the nav bar. Um, and so I can go to shop there. But in, in, actually, we have this free uh, admin um, linked to uh, that particular link. And then we have, um, let's see, uh, we have login, logout um, functionality, um, separate users. And yeah, if you wanna find out more, feel, please feel free to visit this app here. It's a little more pretty and put together, but um, it was a great summer and um, definitely a product of Rails Girls and just not even so much Rails Girls, but just the excellent Ruby community. And um, I'd like to thank everyone for being just so welcoming to newbies like me. Um, and I look forward to talking to each of you. That's it. <laughs> Awesome. All right, so there's, there's only one person brave enough here to take me up on my offer to be coached through a lightning talk. So this is Elizabeth, and she's going to do her first lightning talk, and you're all going to watch it. So step, step up here. Yeah, I'm going to ask you a question, and you just answer and talk to the microphone. Hello, I'm Elizabeth. Uh, I'm Elizabeth. Do you write code? What? Tell them if you write code or not. <laughs> you do tell them about your Pokemon website. I, it's not really a website. Just, just explain it. <laughs> just explain it. I don't know what to explain about it. Okay. You can do it. Fine. All right. So Elizabeth and I were talking earlier, and she has several interests. Who's your favorite Pokemon? Lucario. Why? I just like the design. <laughs> and you're really into Pokemon. What's your favorite thing about Pokemon in general? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> and do you write code? Sort of. Sort of? Us but too. <laughs> <laughs> do you, do you want to write code? Do you think it's exciting? You don't have to look at your mom. You don't half and half. <laughs> I, I'm your coach this time. She's off the board right now. I'm not looking at her. <laughs> um, when you grow up, do you want to do like stuff like what your mom does? Not really. Not really? <laughs> no. Why not? Mm, I don't know. I just want to do some other stuff. <laughs> you, you want to have a more broad range of it, but but wouldn't you like to come up and do an entire like you know, Pokemon My Little Pony 30 slides and talk to people and make it sound like it's about code? 30 but it's really slides, about definitely. 30 slides? No, more than 30 slides. How many slides? How many slides do you think you could fit in 30 minutes? I don't know. A hundred? <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's impressive. I can't do 100 <laughs> slides in 30 minutes. I don't know if you even can or not. Yeah, you, you totally can. Meet Nick. <laughs> um, what's your favorite thing about this conference so far? Everything. <laughs> Do you think you'd want to go to more conferences? The answer is 100% yeah. <laughs> now, what if there was a conference just for kids, kids who wanted to learn how to code? Would you want to go up and talk to other kids about coding? Would you want other kids to speak and then you could hang out in the crowd and all the parents would just sit in the back and not listen? <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, take the parent part off. Would you go to a conference that was just for kids? <laughs> yes. Okay. If you spoke at the conference, would you bring the ears? Of course. 
All right, now, last thing. Say your name again. I'm Elizabeth, again. <laughs> and say thank you to everybody. Thank you. Now, you can hold on now. So, Elizabeth, how, how old are you? Nine. You're nine, okay. So, Elizabeth's nine, and she just came up, and she didn't really have anything she wanted to talk about. That's fine, but she's got some stuff she's really interested, like Pokemon and, and Harry Potter, and... I was going to bring my computer, but it's on, like, 9% battery power. Yeah. So now you're learning about conferences and why it's important <laughs> to find the seats near the plugs. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, I think that the whole idea behind this was to show that if you have an interest in something, it's not really that hard to get up here. If she's brave enough to do this, and, and she got here last night, she's been here in some city she's never seen before with a bunch of adults she doesn't know, and is still willing to get up here and say some of the funniest stuff that we've heard all day, <laughs> it's something you all can do. So Elizabeth's our future. We should train her how to do these things so that when we can't do them anymore, she can. And I think that's it for lightning talks.